Hey, Derek Rowe Entertainment Sue here, and with the release of Black Panther, I thought it was a good time as any to talk about a subject I've wanted to present to y'all for a while, Afrofuturism. So sit back and relax and welcome to Overthinking. At its base, Afrofuturism is a reactionary movement, a movement not out of wanton desperation, but out of necessity. Afrofuturism can be seen as a reaction to the dominance of white European expression and a reaction to the use of science and technology to justify racism and white or Western dominance and normativity. The art created through an Afrofuturist lens is used to imagine futures free of Western European dominance, but also as a tool to critique our current status quos. If you check out many Afrofuturist work, it recognizes that the status quo around the world is the one of political, economic, and social inequality. As with much other speculative fiction, by creating a distinct difference from our current world, a different kind of objectivity can arise, and from that objectivity, we can gain a new ability to look for new possibilities. Instead of imagining counter-futures and pasts utilizing Eurocentric philosophical and political arguments, Afrofuturism is grounded in a number of different inspirations. Inspirations included to, but not limited to, technology, myths from different ethnic groups within Africa, indigenous ethical and social ideas, and historical reconstruction of the African past. Though this imagination and creativity of Afrofuturism is a kind of truth about potential for a different future is brought forward to consider. The power of imagination to not only envision the future, but to affect it, is at the core of the Afrofuturist project. Topics in Afrofuturism include not only explorations of the social construction of race, but intersections of identity and power. Gender and sexuality and class are also explored as is oppression and resistance, colonialism and imperialism, capitalism and technology, militarism and personal violence, history and mythology, imagination and real life experience, utopias and dystopias, and sources for hope and transformation. While many connect Afrofuturism with the lives of people of African descent and European or American diasporas, Afrofuturist work include writings in African languages by African authors. In these works, as well as many of other Afrofuturists, Africa itself is the center of the projection of a future, either dystopian or utopian. The Afrofuturist movement has also been called the Black Speculative Arts Movement. While Afrofuturism as a movement really begins in the mid-1990s, some of its roots can be led back to the philosopher W.E.B. Du Bois. In his writings, Du Bois suggests that the unique experience of darker-skinned people has given them a unique perspective and that this new perspective can be applied to art, including the imagining of a different future. Du Bois can also be considered one of the first Afrofuturist writers with the rediscovery of his short story, The Princess Steel. In The Princess Steel, the reader follows Hannibal Johnson, a black sociologist and adventurer. In this story, Johnson demonstrates his megascope, a machine he created to see across time and space. From the top of a New York building, him and a couple look into the pit of Pittsburgh and see the origin story of steel making that frames steel production within a narrative that critiques historical colonization. Within the story, within a story, the princess Steele is separated from her mother, and after the Lord of the Golden Way kills the princess's lover, she encases him in a hearse of burning, breathing silver spun from her silvery hair. Realizing the value of the steel spun from the princess's hair, the murdering lord takes it strand by strand to create a mighty loom of mills and binds the princess in an imprisonment to which her spun hair held her as it stretched across the world. The steel hair that the Lord of the Golden Way looms becomes the steel in which the modern world is built upon. In the story, the San Francisco and Valles Perazzo earthquakes in 1906 are signs of her anger at the Lord of the Golden Way. Princess Steel goes so far as to warn the murderous lord with the following, I watch and ward above my sleeping lord, so he awake and then woe world when I shake my curls loose. The Princess Steel encapsulated a lot of what Afrofuturism has come to represent. It's a story of speculative fiction that weaves together an exploration of science with a degree of social and political exploration. Now we go from Du Bois to the modern era, where I will now introduce you to Yatasha L. Womack. 
Womack is an award-winning filmmaker, author, journalist, and choreographer. She is author and creator of the Afrofuturist novel 2212 Book of Rayla, first of the award-running groundbreaking Rayla 2212 series. In her book, Afrofuturism, The World of Black Sci-Fi and Fantasy Culture, she provides an easy-to-understand definition of Afrofuturism. She says whether through literature, visual arts, music, or grassroots organizing, Afrofuturists redefine culture and notions of blackness for today and the future. Both an artistic aesthetic and a framework for critical theory, Afrofuturism combines elements of science fiction, historical fiction, speculative fiction, fantasy, Afrocentricity, and magical realism with the non-Western beliefs. In some cases, it's the total re-envisioning of the past and speculation about the future rife with cultural critiques. As we can see by this clear definition, Black Panther and Afrofuturism go hand in hand. Don't believe me? We only have to take a look at the background of the Black Panther. Created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, Black Panther is the first black superhero in American mainstream comics. Virtually no black heroes are created before him and none with actual superpowers. T'Challa, the Black Panther, was first introduced in issue number 52 of the Fantastic Four as a mysterious physicist with a genius intellect, super strength, and enhanced senses granted to him by a great panther deity. In addition to fighting crime as a costume superhero, he's also the king of Wakanda, a technologically advanced, highly secretive country located somewhere in East Africa. After the Fantastic Four assists the Black Panther in defeating his arch nemesis, Ulysses Claw. The Panther begins to slowly integrate himself into the adventures of the world's larger community of super teams. Generally speaking, whenever Marvel's heroes need help with solving a science-related problem, T'Challa is the person they turn to. After a brief stint with the Avengers and Team Spider-Man and Daredevil in the 70s, the Panther's adventures pitted him against villains like Victor Von Doom and the Ku Klux Klan. In holding with Wakandan tradition, the Black Panther tends to wait to get involved in the affairs of other countries for a number of reasons. In addition to his heritage, the Black Panther's greatest superpowers are his kingdom and his country's resources. In the Marvel Universe, Wakanda is known for being peaceful and never having been successfully invaded by another state. Part of this has to do with the country's location, but it's mostly because of its massive vibranium deposits. In the comics, vibranium is a nearly indestructible, energy-absorbing metal that can be used for things like building homes, energy sources, and weapons. It's the same metal that Captain America's shield happens to be made out of. Because Wakanda holds the world's bulk, the country is considered to be something of a stealth superpower. Geopolitically speaking, rather than trading vibranium with the outside world, Wakanda's rulers have chosen to keep the resources to themselves, opting instead to develop technologies and applications for the metal internally. This rapid development of technology has made the nation of Wakanda into a futuristic wonderland, more technologically advanced than many nations in the Marvel Universe. While Black Panther may have been at first created by two white men, over the years we have seen Black Panther and the Wakandian nation portray an Afrocentric world made by a nation of Africans free of Western imperialism and colonization. Black Panther is quintessential Afrofuturism. So why is all of this important? It's because seeing yourself in media is extremely important. I know most people tend to downplay this, but just hear me out. If you are a white person in our society, you're guaranteed racial representation wherever you look, which is most likely why it's not a big deal for many in this group. It is a privilege to be colorblind and identify with anyone. It's not about quarantining races apart so they are encouraged to only identify as themselves. It's that white people are encouraged to identify as anyone they want and people of color are not represented, period. Unfortunately, Hollywood and many TV shows have a long, long history of starring only white people or of casting people of color into racialized roles. Indians as convenience store owners, Native Americans as savages or wise men, black people as various stereotypes and minstrel shows. I remember growing up with my brothers and reimagining a black retelling of Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings because we were so hungry for some form of black representation that wasn't a movie or TV show about black pain, about poverty, about being a gangster or a rapper. Seeing the worldwide excitement for Black Panther is exciting for me as a 22 year old man, but as a kid, you couldn't keep the smile off my face. And that's why Afrofuturism is important. 
Kids don't have to sit down and imagine Denzel Washington as Aragorn or Morgan Freeman as Dumbledore. We can just have representations of ourselves. This has been Derek for Entertainment Stew, and thank you for watching.